what I'm going to do in a little bit of time is show you how this translanguaging works well in classrooms in which, in multilingual classrooms. Um, I want to remind you that translanguaging, for those of you who know a lot about code switching, includes code switching, but it also includes other sense-making discursive practices. Uh, all the discursive practices grounded in bilingual use. So this is a, a use that is very much grounded in bilingual communities and families. <coughs> You cannot go in the United States to many neighborhoods, certainly this neighborhood, this is Washington Heights in northern Manhattan, where uh, if it's not, if you don't really know the two languages, if you don't know how to translanguage, if you don't use these translanguaging practices, you wouldn't know, for example, that in the party goods store they also rent chairs and, and tables. Uh, and uh, a nuevo twist and refreshment is also part of this translanguaging, uh, appealing both to speakers of Spanish and English. But the idea, of course, is that in order to make sense of these bilingual signs, you have to really speak both. Uh, and certainly this is my family, but what I want to say here is that uh, in all bilingual families, it is impossible not to translanguage. In order to make sense of what happens uh, at the dinner table, uh, you have to go from one language to another because indeed uh, these are uh, the only way to make sense of a bilingual family. Certainly when you watch TV, people go from one channel to the other. When you want to include my mother or when you want to exclude her or when you want to, uh, or when you want to include one of the in-laws or exclude her. So this translanguaging is common in bilingual uh, communities and families. So just again to repeat and to make sure that we all understand, I'm defining translanguaging as sense-making bilingual practices from the speaker's perspective and not from a language perspective as code switching has often been studied. So it's from the speaker's perspective it is sense maker making. It is more than from a speaker's perspective, it's from a bilingual speaker's perspective and not from a monolingual or monoglossic perspective. And again, I'll repeat the definition. It includes all student or teacher use of these bilingual multiple discursive practices as sense making of learning or teaching in multilingual classrooms. I'm going to go through four classrooms and uh, to show you how some of this is uh, done in the United States. I realize these are very different contexts uh, than those that you have, but I'm hoping that you can imagine and reimagine what it might be like. Uh, we don't have our act together. We can talk a lot about how uh, difficult these situations are and how attacked bilingualism has been in the United States in the last uh, administration, at least in the last eight years. Um, but um, there are some spaces that we have been able to create. And this is one such space. It's a two-way bilingual kindergarten. And what we mean by this is uh, these two-way bilingual kindergartens include half of the children are English speakers. They speak English at home. Half of the children speak Spanish at home. This is the first year of, um, of uh, mandated and uh, required schooling. So children are coming in, some with English only, some with Spanish only, and they're being instructed together in this model that we call two-way bilingual model. Some people call it dual language. I don't like the term dual language because it negates bilingualism and because it's being used precisely because of the attacks on bilingualism. Uh, and it's very difficult to really support bilingualism and then not to name it. So I want to make sure that we name it. This is as, what is called uh, uh, as a side-by-side -side model. What it means is the teacher on the left uh, is bilingual herself. She's a receptive bilingual. She understands Spanish, but she teaches in English only. 
Uh, the teacher on the right is, uh, who doesn't appear in that picture, but teaches in, uh, in Spanish only. Uh, Maya Starchevich and Ali Terry have been told, that is, by the administrators of the school, that they're supposed to have two linguistic territories. I have a question mark because, as you will see shortly, uh, there aren't two linguistic territories. There are many, many, many more. But for the teachers, what they have been told is that they have to provide the children with an immersion-like experience in English and in Spanish, and that they are supposed to be functioning as monolingual teachers. Now, something that you have to understand is that there are in this, there is in this uh, kindergarten, there are some spaces that are uh, separate, that is where the children uh, who have the same language background are instructed separately in literacy in their home language and also as a second language, a second language. But a lot of the time these children are together for playtime, for lunch, for snack, for lots of other activities. So there are both separate spaces and, um, and uh, joint spaces. But what you see in reality when you sit day after day in this kindergarten class is that it's a lot more complicated than just uh, thinking about it as these two separate spaces. And that indeed when you sit there day after day, like I did many, many days, the first two months of school is what I did, um, what you find is a very flexible language use among the children and among the teachers. Uh, indeed, this translanguaging, which is what enables these children to make sense of what's happening. And I bring you some examples from the children. This is a day, September, school has just started, and the teacher takes the class out. This is supposed to be the English class, right, the ESL class. And I'm sitting next to Alicia outside, and the teacher is going through some comparative exercise. This tree is bigger, that tree is smaller, whatever. And uh, if you ever sat with kindergartners, you know they, they talk out loud all the time, right? <laughs> so I'm sitting next to Alicia, and she's trying it out on her breath, and she says, this tree is grande, which is, of course, grande from the Spanish, and, of course, some of what the teacher was doing. So a way of making sense of this new language for Alicia includes this translanguaging, this way of going back to what she knows and sort of bringing it forth, these bits and pieces that I call it, that just bringing, them, uh, bringing it forth. Here's an example of snack time, where it's one of these heterogeneous spaces where the kids are mixed. And Adolfo and Beatriz are having a snack, Adolfo does not speak English, uh, and he's looking out the window, and he's talking to himself, as they always do. And he says in Spanish to himself, está lloviendo mucho, which means it's raining a lot. And of course, then he looks up, and he realizes that most of the kids around the table are not Spanish speakers, so he realizes. So he says, look, and then he says, it's washing. He knows washing. There's washing afuera, he says. And Beatriz, who is bilingual, because one of the other things I wanted to tell you is that despite the efforts to do this 50-50, this 50-50 doesn't make any sense because these kids uh, might be seen as speaking one or the other in, at home, but indeed, they're, again, the bilingual continuum, the problem is the category. You can't categorize this when people are seen not as learners or having or not having, but as users. People use or not use in different kinds of ways. So Beatriz has um, a lot of English, and she says to Adolfo, está lloviendo, and she asks, uh, she asks him, and then turns to me and explains, he says raining, he speaks Spanish, only Spanish, they're always explaining to me what's going on. <laughs> and, um, and then Beatriz turns to the boy, and then she says, Adolfo, raining. And Adolfo repeats it, raining. So again, all this translanguaging to make sense of what's going on in a very positive way.